calling her witches. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I just had to put that down on tape. Nobody's ever going to know. You will never understand how cold the witches woohoo is. <laughs> EMG Radio episode number 17. 17. This is the first episode marking the beginning of EMG Radio season number two. Number two. Take a dose. A deuce. Taking a deuce. That's funny. Like, I was all like, I don't know if we can how to start this again. Like, I thought it was set, but now I'm all nervous. And then, like, as soon as it starts, we're right back into, like, the same attitude. The same attitude, the same banter. All right. I'm Randy. I'm Louie. And that's what you got today. Um, before we get to the main chunk of today's very special episode, which I'm very excited about for a couple of reasons, but I'll get to that after the news. Um, obviously, if you've been following, if you've been listening to, if you listen to season one, then you know it's been like fucking three months. It's been a while. It's been a while. Feels good to be back, though. It does. Randy was on vacation, and now we're back. Hey, we got to do what we got to do. Mm-hmm. And a lot happened. Um, I'll lead with a lot happened in the EMG world, that is, and the real world, but we're not concerned with the real world. Nothing. We're in our, in the we're, real world. no, we're in our dungeon box here, and that's all that matters. The dungeon box. The intro's always so cheesy sounding, too. <laughs> hey, hey, we're in the, ha, 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 ha. we're funny. <laughs> I'm acting like this is what my personality is like, <laughs> but it's not. Okay. I'm not this chipper and upbeat. My girlfriend's probably rolling her eyes outside. <laughs> don't you judge us <laughs> those fools <laughs> okay emg news it's been three months what the fuck's happened quite a bit uh, i want to lead with the like bad news the don't emg know. website electronic musicians group.com it's dead for now no more emg website uh obviously there's emg radio.blogspot.com because that's hosted for free <laughs> We still got some outlets. We got to have some outlets. And of course, there's the Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash electronic musicians group. And then the Twitter is twitter.com slash EMG artists. Follow that. Follow that. Like it. Love it. But the electronic musicians group.com website is down for now. And mainly because it was just not getting it wasn't getting the tr the use that we were hoping it would get unfortunately unfortunately i thought it was a really cool concept and it looked great it was it was cool and james did a fantastic job and he put a lot of work into that yeah. he it went through two different redesigns you know and the second re redesign was kind of an attempt to like well maybe this is more user friendly more appealing you know and he did a really good job it's not his fault at all in fact he he put the most effort into it and money we can <laughs> as we anybody commend you for that man we do but it just didn't get used hey, um, it got us some more uh, a few more members you anyways. know and that's the thing it really did I, I i just wish it could have it was costing too much money right. and unsustainable at that yeah for what for the amount of use it was getting it just wasn't worth it at the time however however and it did get us some new members which was cool yeah and some listeners, like there's some Facebook likes that are non-member people. That's cool. But um, very good, very good. But as you said, we we still got other outlets that we are uh, using, and it'll be back. That's kind of the that's that's like the one nice thing about it is that I'm bringing it back. It's might, going to be reborn. It's going to be reborn. It'll rise from the ashes, something brand new, and that's kind of like. That's kind of the exciting part is it'll give us a chance to like rethink what that what the elect what the EMG website should be and I've right. got some ideas for it and 
eventually I'll get with James and discuss some things with him, but I think we could do some cool, interesting things. Repurpose with it. it a little bit. Yeah. Shit. Um, okay. So there's that. I'm out of coffee. Are you? <laughs> Fuck, we need a break already. <laughs> um, that went on longer than I expected, just on that little piece. Okay, now on to the good shit. You guys missed the end of the world. Did you know that? EMG listeners, if you didn't know, you missed the end of the world. You did. EMG presents EOTW, which is pretty esoteric and strange like just looking at it but it's at the end of the world compilation album uh we dropped that on the end of the world day it was on the day it was an idea that popped up like james like, introduced it yeah it was james's idea and it was a great idea like i want to say he threw it out there two days before and yeah. it ended up giving everyone 24 hours the idea was you know it was the whole mayan calendar the end of the Mayan calendar, right, December 21st thing. The end of the world was going to happen on December 21st. So we said, hey, let's make an album. Yeah. You start start now. You got 24 hours. Boom. Put an album together. And it came together fast. Yeah, it did. It was awesome. I was very impressed. Like, And, and, and it was good, too. It's like, a good album. I was just listening to a part of it today, actually. I listened to a big chunk of it. Oh, I listened to it over and over again when it first came out. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um. And you can get that at uh, e-m-g.bandcamp.com. I'm glad I have all these fucking websites memorized. It burned into my brain. But, you know, last season, you pimped the same websites, like, every week. Yeah. You know, for 16 weeks. Just in weeks. case you didn't know. But, yeah. So that's pretty sweet. It's got, it's got all the usuals, some new people. It's a pretty good album. It's magnificent. It is. Download it now. And aside from that, there have been, especially uh, recently, there have been numerous EMG artist album releases, you know, the members releases, not, not EMG albums, but albums released by EMG members that are really excellent. And I forgot that I was going to compile a list so I could do a quick pimp of that, but really... Well, that'll probably just wait for a regular episode. That'll be on the next regular episode. We'll yeah. probably even start spinning a couple of tracks off of those <coughs> albums, too. Yeah, we, exactly. Exactly. The next regular episode we do, we'll spin, we'll pick, we'll pick something from all the new albums, and we'll spin some stuff, we'll spin some stuff from the End of the World album. But that's not what we're here today for. Also, another thing, big thing, EMG Radio. Uh, we're not going back to the weekly schedule like season one. Changing things up a little bit. We are. At the very least, we're going to shoot for one episode a month, which is kind of a stretch, but like the weekly schedule is just not going to work for me anymore. Uh, I would like to do two a month, so once every two weeks, that'd be good. But I'm not going to commit to a regular schedule like last time. Right. That becomes difficult to correlate everyone's schedules. That, it really does. To correlate everyone's schedules, get everything co coordinated, everything set up, you record everything. And if I didn't have to edit the episodes, it wouldn't be a problem. Sure. But like like I was telling you just before we started recording, it t it's like a four-night ordeal every week. Yeah. Because, you know, we all work regular jobs. Yeah, and you gotta then, keep the income going. You're you're busy. You're tired after your work. There's other things you yeah. might want to do sometimes. Exactly, you know? and then you schedule. Then trying to get everyone coordinated to to co-host and guest appear and all that. Whatever <laughs> I'm trying to say, to get everyone together. So then the recording is one night, and that's that's pretty much the night. Yeah, and that'd be all right. But then the editing is really like it usually takes like two nights. And then the fourth night is posting and writing it up, you know, uploading the track, posting it, pimping the posts everywhere. Right. Pretty long process. Yeah, when you're trying to run all aspects of the project, it becomes mm. much more of a task. Yeah, an endurance test. Absolutely. <laughs> but we, 15 months, or 15 months, holy shit, 15 weeks straight, <laughs> 15 weeks straight, and then you could tell, I could tell, by the time that 15th episode hit, I was already, I was in vacation mode because the 16th one, we skipped a week and then did the 16th episode. Right. And like, we skipped that week because I was like, fuck. 
And that was during a point when everybody was getting swamped with all oh, the yeah. random ass things in, in our lives, like different work crap, different family crap, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. I really like keeping such a strict schedule like that, but it was a lot of stress. So how it's going to be now is, like I said, um, I'm not going to promise anything, but I'm going to try at least once a month, if we can, to... And it sounds like there might be some, like, we'll have some special stuff going on. It won't necessarily all fall on my shoulders every time, and that'll be real nice. Not only that, but I think that'll give us an opportunity to actually compile a good list of music from everybody, give everybody a chance to kind of throw at us what they want to mm -hmm. spin. For sure. For sure. And, yeah, that that's another thing. I'm... I'm pretty sure there's probably a couple tracks that just because of the heck like how hectic it was to get everything organized that kind of slipped through the cracks from last season that i was like oh yeah i'll play next i'll play next episode i don't know what those tracks are i'm pretty sure right. they never got played i feel kind of bad about that but it, you know we apologize to anybody who possibly didn't get a track played but we do we do try we try to get them in there oh yeah yeah um i'm just not gonna I'm not going to stress as bad about getting them done so they won't be as regular, but I'll try to make sure it's still consistent. Uh, we'll have other people. We'll do the radio episode still. We'll do the inter uh, the interview episode still. Um, we're looking at some other specialized episodes. I like the idea like we did that last episode, even though it was like technically kind of a clusterfuck, that last episode from season one we did where we had like six, seven people. Yeah, that was that was fun, though. That was a lot of fun. It was fun to listen to. Um We'll do more like that. Harder to organize, but it was worth the effort. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, between computer crashes. Oh, it it ended up working out pretty well. Robot though. cave. Robot cave voices. Getting, getting lost in the robot digital cave of hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, we spent like 15 minutes talking about all this. That's what... Good. This is what we do. This is content, motherfucker. This is content. Oh, and at some point, I do want to go back... And, nah, that's not important either. That'll be behind the scenes shit anyway. That'd be a lot of work. You don't get to know no you don't behind get to know. the scenes shit. You don't get to know. Don't look behind the curtain. It's a surprise. Yo. You handled the Wizard of Oz reference a lot better than Steve did. At one time, I think it was the, the I think it was the Dungeon Box episode. Oh, was it? Those are the mono -y mono ones. It's always the Dungeon Box. That's when you close it. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. And I threw out the, the Wizard of Oz, be, don't look behind the curtain thing, and it fucking stopped him dead in his tracks. You kept going. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that aside, so what the fuck are we doing today? What's happening? Today we have... <laughs> yeah. Where am I? Today, uh, I'm excited about today's episode for a couple of reasons. I'm always excited when it comes time to do an interview with somebody. So far, it's always been over Skype. Um, excited and a little nervous. Today, I'm not so nervous. Yep. But I am excited because this is the first in-person, one-on-one interview, so that's awesome. Today I'll be interviewing Louie. Louie. And I know I usually co-host a lot of the times on the regular episodes, so I chimed in with the news. We said, why not? You well, know, we'll just do the usual co-host thing. You know, Steve's not with us today, so he will be on the next regular episode, of course. But now I'm co-host list. That is not a word. I'm co-host list. Okay, Lou's no longer co-host. Now I revert to the position of... Special guest. Special guest interviewee. Today I have a special guest with me. It's Lou. And also another reason I'm really excited for this interview is because like a lot of our music history is pretty entwined. We've worked on a oh, lot yeah. of projects and stuff together. Yeah, um, we collaborated back in high school. We tried to start a couple of little bands, you know. Yep. It was fun, though. It, yeah. You know, oh, we, yeah. We might not have gotten huge and famous and or went anywhere with it, but we had a lot of good times doing that. We were we were huge. We were famous. Okay, let's rewind back a little bit. So again, I'm here with Louis Kiefer of Subliminal Hit. Now I've got my list of questions here. Alrighty. These eventually I'll revamp these questions, but these are the same questions, and occasionally you know you you kind of like go off the off the script a little bit. Which is good, but these are the same questions I've asked everybody. So you get you get the official list. I will go through the official list. Okay, first off, where are you from, Lou? At this point in time, I am from Omaha, Nebraska. And you always lived in Nebraska? Uh, yeah, I was born and raised in Nebraska. I'm gonna make this list small so you can't jump ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> I know all the questions. I get special eye vision of them. No. 
Avert your eyes. Okay. <laughs> All right. They burn my eyes. It's sacred information. And how you been doing lately? I've been doing pretty good, you know, just trying to stay busy. We've had a couple of little snowfalls, which suck. Mm -hmm. We have to scrape the driveway, scoop the driveway. And we're supposed to have another snowstorm. I'm not very happy about oh, that. Oh, no, it's supposed to be nasty, too. Yeah, dude. Lou, do you recall the first genre or band you considered yourself to be a fan of? And how old were you? First genre or band? I would have to say I remember hearing Don't Worry, Be Happy when I was a little kid. My parents would play that on the old record player, and I loved that song. Dude, that sounds like, yeah, I could see your parents playing that for you, yeah. So that's my basic first childhood memory of music. Actively becoming a fan, though, that would probably be a different thing. When I was in high school, I kind of went through the, an alternative grunge phase, and I really loved bands like Nirvana and, like, The Offspring and bands like that. Stone Temple Pilots, even Pearl Jam. I love Pearl Jam because... Eddie Vedder is a fucking awesome singer. And a lot of those came from, you know, I'd be listening to the music that my parents would listen to. I'd be listening to the music that my brothers would be listening to. And I was a little kid at the time. So really, I did get into music when I was fairly young. And you have two older brothers, yeah? I do have two older brothers. <laughs> so they did. I mean, being the younger brother, they did influence me mm -hmm. with the, mu the music they listened to. You baby Lou. I'm the baby. It's weird asking you questions like that. We're like, and you have two older brothers, right? <laughs> like, I fucking know. I've talked to them what, both. you don't know that? <laughs> I know your brothers. <laughs> when did you uh, start approaching music from the creative end, creating music, playing music? Well, I took piano lessons when I was fairly young, like age six or seven. And I did that until I was basically in high school. And then I dropped out of doing that. And pretty much didn't really start getting into actually creating my own music until about 2005, when I started wanting to make my own brand, my own sound. The solo Lou sound. The solo sound. And yeah. that is the same year that I made the, the name Subliminal Hit for my solo project. That's a good name. I've always been envious of that name. I think I've said that on other you episodes, though. That. Yeah, <laughs> damn it. Will you sell it to me? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you took piano lessons. I took some piano lessons, you know, learned some of the basics when I was a little kid, and uh, you know, I got, I, I got all right. You know, I memorized a few little songs and stuff like that for the piano teacher, and that was all fun and dandy, but that wasn't necessarily when I was into the, the creative aspect of things. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that was kind of beyond me at that point. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, about 2005, I started getting very interested in making my sound and experimenting a lot more. Gotcha. And what was it? What Was there a specific thing that got you into um, the idea of creating your own music, working on your own sound? Well, really, to tell you the truth, like, like you'd mentioned, a lot of our music history is intertwined. Uh -huh. And I honestly didn't know anything about making electronic music or mixing music until I actually started hanging out with you back in the day. So <laughs> I do have to give you credit. You taught me a lot of like how it works. Just, oh. I was like, man, you know, this is awesome. And what are you doing? Like, how do you do that? And you'd show me a couple of things. I'd be like, oh, that's sweet. The interviewer has become part of the story. <laughs> the interviewer has become part of the story. <laughs> and then I, I kind of seen it coming, but I was like, oh, this is weird. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like a meta thing. It's like standing outside of yourself watching something happen. Yeah. This is an out-of-body experience. You know, what was the first band or project that you were involved in? I think you would remember this. <laughs> I do remember. That's well, why this. That's why this interview is actually kind of weird. <laughs> there was. A, that's funny. Well, yeah, a lot of this is just going to be like reminiscing of things. It will. <laughs> yeah. It will. But that's all right. And it, this is for them, not for me. Indeed. indeed. And I've, I've already learned stuff I didn't know. But true that. that. True that. We shall be unveiling new things. Yo. Okay. First band. First band uh, was a grunge metal band with a bassist, a guitarist, and vocals, and that's it. Yep, yep. And we called it Freak Breed. Freak Breed. Yeah, and eventually we brought in a, a keyboardist uh, with uh, quotations 
to do our drums and all he would have to do is it wasn't like making up his own drums we just like this is the drum pattern you just hit this button and it starts playing the drums so that's and it was one of those like really really cheap old keyboards with the really cheesy drum patterns oh yeah on it. oh yeah it said it it was not it was not that groovy but some of those songs were all right, you know. Oh, we got my brother in on that. He did some yep. crazy screaming. Mm -hmm. I think he kind of tore up his voice. He did. Well, and he went to college too. So that's where he went. But he he did. He tore his voice up real bad. Yeah. Jacob. Yeah. He, he tore his voice up real what bad. What was the name of that song? Uh, My Dog? My Dog. <laughs> okay, so... See, this is where, the, this is where me interviewing you gets weird. Because then I'm going to step in. But Freak Breed was kind of interesting because me and you would both switch off of bass and get, wait, no. We would switch. We always, we had a bassist who was always on bass. Right. But me and you would switch between vocals and guitar. One would do guitar, the other vocals, and then switch back and forth. Your brother would come in and do vocals. And at the beginning, he was like a regular vocalist. And then we'd also like do vocals with him. And then he left and it was just us switching back and forth. Right, right. But <laughs> we... We were the like we used to crank out a new song every practice. It was a good oh, practice yeah. if we had a whole new song beginning to end. Yeah, we <laughs> practice never really was practice. No. Because we pretty much just made up something new every single mm -hmm. time. But eventually it did get to a point where we did start trying to play older songs. Because I remember mm -hmm. we tried to throw um little shows like at little house parties yep, and stuff like yep. that. There was the one house party where we had one song, and I think I'm pretty sure it was Freakin'. It was Freakin'. That was our first song, right? Yeah, that was the first the ever freaking song. Freaking out about little shit. Freaking out. <laughs> I could, that's so crazy, because that's so ingrained. I could almost start singing it with you. Certain parts, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we played that one song like three times, and then that's when we made up on the spot the My Dog song, because it was about uh, Rachel's dog shitting on someone's hand. Right, her right. cousin Heather's hand. Yeah, yeah, and that's where the song came from. <laughs> run it, run it, run it, run it, run it, run it, boom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's that. I'm sorry to jump in on your interview. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. And somewhere I have pictures. I really need to find. There's those. some pictures. There's um, some. actually, a couple of the freak breed pictures of you and me, where we created the mock. Like car accident the mock death without scenes. any damage on the vehicles. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> and the gun with the plastic laid out, and we'd have to hold the gun to each other. Right, right. Oh yeah. Are those online? I thought I. I see. I thought play, I play, motherfucker, play. Yo, yo. <laughs> exactly. I thought I scanned all that shit. It's so it's got to be somewhere. I'll have to dig it up. Maybe I'll post a link or a couple. Of, post a couple of those. Post some sausage links. Yeah, <laughs> sausage links. <laughs> so that was freak breed. That was the first. That's the first breed. like ever musical project that I think I actually went into, and that was actually much further before I ever even thought about it going oh, that into was, a solo project. That was ninety nine or ninety ninety nine or two thousand. It yeah, was about two thousand. I was like a freshman in uh -huh. high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we played for Butch's graduation party. Well, kind of. Till we got booted till to another location, right? We so were, that we was the year to. I graduated. So it was about two thousand. We were doing that ninety nine two thousand. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Our practice space was a barn, which was pretty awesome. The loft of the barn. Yep, that was pretty awesome. It was never really like it wasn't being utilized as a barn. It was being like mm -hmm. revamped into like a chill area. Mm -hmm. It worked out pretty nicely. It was fun. Okay, how many... Um, oh, I got the nickname, the Cussin' Kid. The, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how That's I got that nickname from that band. It, well, yeah. most of our songs were pretty much cuss words. It was a requirement. See, it was it was all very juvenile. <laughs> but it was a requirement. We're like, it's got to be a cuss word. And there was even a couple times, I'm pretty sure there wasn't, that we were like, no, we have to put it in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what the fuck was wrong with this? I don't think like, we're... this isn't a song... That's no word. That's no cuss word. Oh, shit. Fuck. <laughs> the cussing kid. Oh, yeah. Dude. We... There was that one night my dad came up with the uh, harmonica. Remember that? I used that to. That was fun. I used to have that, that 
cassette tape and then it fucking it got lost i know it was dude. in someone's car their car got repossessed basically that sucks and that tape was good because that had a that recording. was probably the best practice we ever had as freak breed exactly that had a recording of like all of her songs it had the intro where your dad played harmonica or monica uh, i'm probably saying that wrong harmonica 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 <laughs> Having trouble with basic words. All right. So, have you been involved in many projects? Like, what is a brief history of? So, you had your piano lessons, and then your first. Did Did you get in on Orchestra of Destruction much? I know you went to practice with us, but I think that's where Freak Breed came from. I went to a few practices, and yeah, that's kind of the basic. Because then, when you we started came talking me, about it, you, me, and Jacob, like you came with us to practice, but. Jacob was in that kind of in that band, and that's kind of how and Jacob and him came. Went with you over there, okay, right, right? Okay, so Freak Breed. So, what take us through like a rough history for, of from like the very beginning Freak Breed to like you said two thousand five was this beginning of subliminal hit. Okay, so there was Freak Breed, and then two thousand five, I started doodling around, you know, mm -hmm. subliminal hit. And it was probably around 2000, later 2005 to early 2006 when we started conceptualizing Three Blind Minds. Yeah. And, you know, that's where a lot of the older material comes from that you hear in Ghosts in the Collective. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It comes from that era. Mm -hmm. When we were first conceptualizing Three Blind Minds, we didn't really know where we were going with it at the time. We were just kind of like doing weird little projects and mm -hmm. switch offs. And the switch offs, yeah. Beat creations where one person will make a beat and then somebody else would fill in the music to it. And at that point, God, we were so behind because the, we didn't have internet. And actually, I like the internet was a little different then, but that's really not that long ago. We probably could have got around what we did. Right. We were so behind on like oh, our computers. Oh, we were ancient. We were, we would transfer songs by way of, oh, what is it called? Those three and a half floppy disks. Was it the three and a half? Yeah. Yeah, and that like, was back when they still actually even put them in computers. Yeah, we like had that. disks. And the disks were only like 2.6 megabytes. So in order to get, <laughs> that's a weird number. I wonder if that's exactly what they were. That's a weird number to pull out of my ass. Anyway, so it was like two, it was two point something or three point something. It wasn't very much. A couple megabytes. So in order to get like a song's worth of samples, like I remember you coming over to my apartment and you'd have a stack of like 10 to 12 discs. Yeah, a whole pack. A whole pack of discs. <laughs> and that whole pack of discs was for one song's one worth song. of fucking samples and shit. Oh my God, that shit was crazy. Like, yeah, I got something for you to work on. Here's this box. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of that was kind of hip hop based. Kind yeah. of. Well, the switch offs and stuff were different. That was just kind of our like crazy whatever sound. While we were conceptualizing Three Blind Minds, I do remember we were going to start a side project with hip hop involving hip hop. Yeah. But I think basically what ended up happening is we just smashed it all together. And, and that became what Three Blind Minds is today. And that was kind of new scene. New scene. New scene I remember being much. like one of the first like we threw down it. We actually threw down hip hop style vocals. Yeah, and we're like, okay, this is three line mind song. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Um, Taking a trip down memory lane. Okay, this works nicely into the the next question. What projects are you currently involved in? Right now, I am currently just focused on Subliminal Hit and Three Blind Minds. I'm open to collaboration, of course, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's pretty much all I'm doing at this point. Yeah, Three Blind Minds has kind of been on vacation, too. It's been on vacation. For about a year. <laughs> we had a couple of meetings after we released Ghost. Got like mm -hmm. a, the skeleton of a, of, of a song for the next album made. Mm -hmm. And then that was right around the same time basic time where we decided we needed a break and this right here this is kind of what took over the three blind minds recording sessions true that it took up a it ended up taking out a lot of time but EMG you know radio did yeah. it, it was worth it you know i'm down for allowing the emg radio to grow mm -hmm. a little spot and well we we kind of were in an agreed upon break we we're like we're gonna stop take a break for a while right. work on solo stuff and then 
then I threw EMG radio at you guys, you know. Indeed. <laughs> Which is cool. I mean, I had never had any experience ever even thinking about talking on any sort of show. And now it's all about you. It is it's all on you, Lou. Oh my god. It is all on your shoulders. You're carrying the weight of this show. <laughs> yeah. Okay, three blind minds aside. The current project is Subliminal Hit. Yes. Your solo project. It says 2005, but that's what you're currently really focusing on. Right. And um, I am about ready to release an album. Yeah? Shortly. Very, very soon here. And I'm not going to give you a release date. It's just going to happen. <laughs> it's just going to happen. EMG's going to be the first to know, though. He's going to subliminally hit you with an album out of nowhere. Exactly. Uh, fuck yeah. Yeah. Um, this first album that I'm releasing is called Subliminal Deep Good Times, and that's actually the title of one of the tracks on there that is from, like, 2005. Yeah, yeah. There a lot of, like, a lot of track, older tracks revamped and stuff. All of them, are, yeah, all of them are older tracks that I had revamped. Um, the range of dates runs from like 2005 and the most recent one i believe is 2010. that's pretty crazy a five-year span yeah. of like wow that's pretty cool and although i do have newer music that i've been working on and i've even presented newer music to people on emg people on the internet through mm -hmm. my soundcloud i decided it'd be better to kind of do this revamp project and a lot of the songs, they're not in their original, original condition in their raw form because, you know, I was a new mixer. There was a lot of things I didn't know then that I know now. Mm -hmm. And so revamping gave me at least the chance to kind of maybe beef a few things up that need to beef down, tone a few things that maybe needed to tone down, and basically trip out and add <laughs> delays and make it psychedelic <laughs> sounding. Yeah. How did you come up with the title Subliminal Hit? You know, that's a great question because that even baffles me because when I think about my music, a lot of the things that I think about when I listen to my own music is some of the background noises. I get enthralled with the background noises almost so much to a point that I can even end up overlooking some of the big structures of the song. I try not to let that take over to a fault, though. You know, I'll go back and try to, like, appropriate things. But a lot of the times, yeah. So I think in the back of my mind, that's how I came up with the title, because I was always thinking about the subliminal sounds. So subliminal hit, you know. Yeah. It's grown on me. Over, and it, yeah, 2005, I mean, I guess it's been with me <laughs> yeah, for Yeah, no while. shit. It's coming up on 10 years. That's crazy. And, yeah, now it's the first time I'm actually ever really tried to promote my music aside from posting my SoundCloud every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Did you post much on Acid Planet? Um, Acid Planet, I, or did you I just got into more AcidPlanet.com for a little while, yeah, and there was a couple of songs that I posted that made it to a number one chart in like experimental genre for like a day or two. Uh -huh. So I kind of felt proud about that. I was like, oh, yeah. that's cool, all right. You know, it's funny, there's probably like one, maybe two dudes out there like, holy shit, Acid Planet? Yeah. Acid Planet's still going, too. That's amazing. Right, right. My profile's still there, too, yeah. with all the old, old stuff. Once in a while, once in a while. You want to sneak? You want to? You want to peek at some like old subliminal hit? Hit up Acid Planet and search search him up. That's in the raw. Actually, <laughs> some of the tracks <coughs> that I revamped would be on that Acid Planet in a raw form. That's like a treasure hunt for the listeners. If you want to do the research, um, shoot, I don't even know if I could remember what my profile. If I can remember it, put it in the show notes or so. Okay, so people okay. can peek at the old crap if they want to. Oh, yeah. It's a little more of a novelty thing. Like, I wasn't the most talented producer back in 2005. But, yeah, know, yeah. I was, uh, I was doing what I could at the time. Uh -huh. I got into it and was like, hey, this is fun. I, I enjoy this. I always liked music before, but composing it and arranging it had a new appeal to me. How would you describe your music to someone who has never heard it? Um, chill, eclectic, you know, it's usually electronic in nature, obviously, but I do throw out the occasional acoustic, like, jam on the guitar, but even then, a lot of the times, I'll add some electronic effects to that, and, you know, I'll duplicate the track and reverse it and add all kinds of different effects to it. Mm -hmm. I am 
NFX Junkie. Mm-hmm. I I think that's probably one of my favorite parts of the mixing process when it comes down to it is just smacking on the effects and seeing what kinds of noise I can come up with out of the noises that I already played out. Mm-hmm. Well, since you're in Three Blind Minds, I, I feel weird kind of bringing it up since I'm in there too, but this question will be relevant. Um... You're Three Blind Minds, which is definitely, like, it's a band, but it's more of, like, we always look at it more of a collaboration, which feels more accurate than to say, you know, we're in a band. Oh, absolutely. Because then well, people expect you any... to bust out drums yeah. and the guitar and, like, we'll play us some songs. We don't just exactly sit down <clears throat> and play our music live at this point, especially mm-hmm. with the equipment that we have. It's more of a pass back and forth almost more of an even an emg style online internet collaboration at times in a way like i mean it's a little bit different but in a way the way that emg has gone on a lot of projects and stuff is kind of like a larger scale version of what we initially started doing with three blind minds which is pretty pretty interesting now that i think about it oh yeah okay so who does your who does your band or who does your collaboration project consist of and how would you describe the roles each member plays well there would be you me <laughs> there would be myself you and there would be a steve steve so the regular so, host uh, <laughs> <MD Radio. laughs> it's all very incestuous this whole everything we do <laughs> whoring ourselves we're out. whoring ourselves in multiple out. ways yeah yeah you know. <laughs> it's funny when you when you say it like that. Um, the roles that we all play is really we all three throw down on vocals. We all three throw down on samples. To an extent, we all three throw down on production. Mm-hmm. But I would say that you do a lot heavier on the production side. You know, and I think it works out great the way that we can collaborate. And also noting. With Three Blind Minds, like, our styles that we normally listen to sometimes differ in a lot of different ways. Oh, yeah. And seeing what we come up with collectively when we decide to mash it all together. And I think it works out well because it's not a clash mash. Uh Uh-huh. It it, it intertwines like we give and take Mm -hmm. on certain parts. You can hear hear the more chill-out stuff, which is a lot of your... Which is a lot from your end. Yeah. Not that you listen to just chill-out, but, you know... You listen to a lot more chill out stuff. Steve listens a lot more hip hop stuff. Um, I bring some of the like, well, we, and then we, but we overlap on a lot of stuff too. But I'll bring like more of the distorted, edgy, right. industrially stuff, and then we overlap on stuff like we all listen to some hip hop stuff. We oh, all yeah. got into oh, dubstep yeah. stuff like that. Another thing to note with Three Blind Minds is like the roles we play is always kind of it varies. So like. On this first album, I did a lot of the production work, but there's also, there's a couple tracks that was they're all Lou or remixes or like mixes that Lou did. And, you know, so it varies on the next album. Who knows how it'll go? You know, yeah. we just kind of play it by ear. I imagine the next album being more newer material and less revamp that Ghosts was. Um, I can imagine seeing a little bit more different types of collaborations oh, yeah. that we see. Because, yeah, obviously I think we're going to do a lot of the classic, all three of us, Mm -hmm. going to town on it. We're going to gangbang that album. Gangbang that album. So, you're going to spin a track for us off of the new album? This is off of the album. Um, The track you're about to listen to is called Cinder. Uh, The original track was mixed in 2006, Mm -hmm. I believe. So, and then I just added some delays and got some funky little noises to come out of that original track when I revamped it and had a lot of fun doing it so this is Cinder by Subliminal Hit.
I like that song. That's got a really good, it's got a really good, like, warm. Yeah. Which Cinder is yep. great, actually, but it's got a real warm, I didn't even think about it, real warm feeling. And the drums are there and they're strong, but they're not overpowering. They lay a nice background for it. Right, right. That's kind of what I was going for, like a very, like, distant almost kind of sound. Um, I don't know if anybody notices it or not, but um, I delayed, I duplicated the track and delayed it heavily and turned it down a lot. But in the background, it kind of sort of sounds like a train, like running on the tracks. Mm -hmm. But that's actually really just the drum samples and just the way that it just happened to delay the way that it happened to line up. So you duplicated the whole track? Yeah, I duplicated the whole song. Like the finished, you took the... Yeah, yeah, the original, the raw version of it, and then I applied the heavy effects on the one duplication and then, you know, quieted it down so it doesn't overpower too uh -huh. much. That's interesting. So it kind of blends in. Oh, yeah. That's pretty cool. Which is the approach I took with pretty much all of the tracks that I revamped with. I pretty much just let them be in the original form. I EQ'd, you know, mm -hmm. that, and then I started duplicating and heavily affecting the duplicates. That's that's interesting. So are a lot of those like um, are a lot? Were they the renders? Did you re-render them from the original files, or they or files? Or are they like uh, the original project files, or are they like the original renders from back in the day? Um, some of them were actually just old, like, waves that I had to go dig in and find. Yeah. Um, actually, some of the project files are non-existent. So, or, or if I can find the project files, some of the samples involved and some of the recordings involved are gone, too. Oh. On old computers or just lost altogether. Yeah. Yeah, I hate that. that suck it's it does about suck. working with samples so heavily yeah that's the only thing that kind of bums me out sometimes about working on m music on the computer so that's interesting that you duplicated them and then added effects and stuff like that but i imagine that was good at like beefing them up adding some more depth and stuff to the that's pretty cool i didn't know that and some of them some of them you can blatantly tell that i did more to than others because there was a few songs that i was like okay I kind of like just the way this is in its form, just going to touch up a little bit and just leave it at that. And, you know, others where it's like, well, the FX heavily changed the original version. Now, here's a, this this next couple of set of questions are, I don't know why, but they're some of my favorite. What title would you give yourself in regards to being a musician? Would you be like singer, songwriter, producer, composer, guitarist? All You know. I would probably just say like a producer... Um, slash composer and a guitarist. I do sing, but I can't really consider myself a singer songwriter at this point because, yeah. you know, basically I've got an ability to sing that I don't really do, but, um, and then I write poetry. Mm -hmm. So basically, I just I don't connect those two things and I don't know why. Maybe yeah. it'll come later, maybe not, but yeah, at this you point, it's producer and guitarist. But you know, you know, I write some of the lyrics for Three Blind Minds oh, and certainly. do some vocals, mm -hmm. obviously, in tracks on Three mm -hmm. Blind Minds. So I can't necessarily like say I don't do anything involved with singing or vocals, but I just don't do much with it at this point. Gotcha. I'll remember that when we're working on the next Three Blind Minds album. Like Louis, <laughs> sing it. Guess what, buddy? You're doing more vocals. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what, buddy? This song, all you. Sing it. I can't. But Randy, this is like slow, slow, slow jams, R and B. Slow jams. Yep. I can't do it. Do it. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. See, girl, it's gonna happen. Okay. And no, that's not where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> now I know your mixing styles similar in a way. Your method is similar in a way to mine, but. Take us on a typical, take us on the journey of a typical song. Yeah. Take us on the journey of the typical song creation process for you. Like, where do you start and go f forward? This, a song creation usually, in most cases for me, starts with experimenting with making 
synths and loops. I'll experiment with making different synth loop sounds and then I'll find like one or a combination of synths that I like or samples that I like and I'll kind of mix it together a certain way. A lot of the times that's where I start it and then I'll kind of construct a beat based around that. But then there's the few times that I, you know, get the structure down first. I get the beat going first. And basically between the two, I started out like that. Then I take it into mixing and that's when I start to kind of construct it, how it's actually going to end up turning into. Is it going to be a short little song? Is it going to be a long song? That's where I kind of decide that part. And uh, yeah, I either, I'll either just leave it alone and it'll start gathering dust on my hard drive or I'll start working more into it and adding FX and EQing it. And eventually, like my next release after this is going to involve a little bit more actual newer material too. So a little bit more of the full working process that I put into music is going to be evident in the next release because this obviously is a little bit broken up. I did some of the work way back when uh -huh. and then the rest of the work in 2012, you know, mm -hmm. and finishing it up, wrapping it up here in 2013. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I hadn't really thought about it and it does differ a little bit from my, uh, from my process, which is interesting for as long as I've worked on you, i worked on, worked on you. I am a robot. <laughs> you know, been... I've been ratcheting gears. <laughs> oh. Randall, <laughs> Randall created me in 2005. <laughs> <laughs> Louis didn't exist before then. Uh, um, <laughs> I was like, go forth. You will be subliminal hit. <laughs> um, but as long as I've worked with you on projects, I hadn't really thought about your process of doing, putting, to, it's true though, now that I think about it, but the loops first you put together and you do do that. You experiment with it, like, you kind of like set yourself up with your own sample packs, just full of like crazy loops and wild instruments and different stuff like that. And then, then you go to town on those as like part of the mixing process. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely. Cool. It kind of, yeah, it just kind of establishes, uh, I guess like a vibe mm -hmm. for you to work with. Like, okay, this is the feeling that I'm working with. You know, even if you're not necessarily starting the song with that, maybe that sound doesn't even pop up until way in, later in the song, but it's still kind of like, uh, this is the feeling that I'm going for with like maybe a sample that you created. Excellent. Excellent answer. Of the entire music process, writing, recording, mixing, promotion, releasing, performing, which is pretty much the entire process, what is your favorite part? Um, you know, I'd have to say like, yeah, mixing, mixing it together, that's where it all falls together. I know it can get tedious, but I don't know, I, I enjoy the composition part of it. Um, performance is fun, you know, that's more like when I'm jamming on my guitar or something mm -hmm. like that. Like, I enjoy that and everything, and I like playing the parts out, and I like recording the parts, but it really starts falling together in the mixing process. Oh, yeah. So I would have to say, yeah, mixing is probably my favorite part. And your least favorite? Uh, the least favorite part... Um, you know, it would probably be when it gets to the point of, like, promoting it, because I don't know... Who's going to listen to it? Who's not going to listen to it? I don't know how the public is going to react to my creation, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, I, th I think that's the part about it that I like the least because it's like, ah, uh, like I, I enjoy the idea that people are going to be hearing it. I, and I, and, and I hope everybody enjoys it and whatnot, but, uh, yeah, that part just kind of makes me cringe a little bit. Okay. So question off the top of my head, take out people react positively. They're like, oh, we love you, love you, love you. Give, give me your cock, you know. <laughs> Take that part out. What do you think is worse? Do you think it'd be worse to get a negative reaction, or does it feel worse to get no reaction? Um, you know, I mean, it's probably better not to get a reaction. You know what I'm saying? Like, because if you hear something negative, you're just like, you're just gonna be like, uh, well, uh, fuck off. I don't care. Uh, you know, which is naturally the response you should have yeah, yeah. or you're going to get really down on yourself mm -hmm. and you'd be like, Oh, I, I suck. Mm -hmm. But you know, in reality they suck. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what everybody should remember on that one. Good answer. Okay. Musically, what do you feel 
are your strengths? I, I think my biggest strength is just in the idea of improv and just kind of being able to do things on the fly. Mm -hmm. Okay. That would probably, to sum it up in a short, quick answer, that would probably be my strength. And what areas do you feel less confident in? In those areas, probably would be the actual, like, structuring of things. I, uh, you know, like I said, I get lost in the subliminal sounds. It's kind of where the title came from. So sometimes if I get too lost in working on, like, an echo or some kind of delay, you know, that kind of makes the structure suffer a little bit at times. What? No, no comes together as a part of my sound, which I'm fine with, but yeah, I would say I'm a little less confident in that area. That's one of those areas, and I have the same issue where once you get into, like, knob tweaking mode, right. you just go, like, you can kill hours, and then at the end, you're like, Psh, I don't like this anyway. Right, you know, right. It's you're like, like well, well, I'm not going to do that anyways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of the other guys that I've talked to, especially when you get into, like, messing with synths or tweaking effects or just things like that, that's like... That's a common that's a common issue. What kind of software do you use? Software I as of lately I've been using Ableton a lot more. Really? Yeah, yeah, I, uh you know, when I got the uh the launch pad, mm -hmm. we got the launch pad and uh I started kind of experimenting with Ableton. But I still toggle back and forth between Acid uh, Fruity Loops and Ableton. I like them all for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Fruity Loops I like better for loop creation, and I kind of develop a lot more of my samples in Fruity Loops because I can use Sample Tank, mm -hmm. and I can't use Sample Tank in Ableton for some reason. I yeah, don't understand. Yeah, I don't get that. I don't get that. It, it's weird. It does work in Fruity Loops, though? Sample yeah, tank? Sample Tank okay. works just okay, fine cool. in Fruity Loops. So then I can render out like a wave of whatever I recorded there, and then remix it either in Ableton or Acid, which my Acid's actually been kind of messing up lately, so it's kind of been more heavy on the mm -hmm. Fruity Loops and the Ableton lately, oh, yeah. which which I'm fine with. Um, I'm getting used to Ableton. There's a few things that, yeah, you just, you're not used to in getting mm -hmm. into a new program, and, and it's a tendency to be like, well, fuck that. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm starting to kind of learn a few of the ropes, and getting adapted to different things. So Ab I'm all right with it. Ableton's a really good program. It's just like you said, I, I have a problem getting past that. Well, fuck that stage. <laughs> <laughs> fuck that. Fuck that shit. I just spent 20 minutes on this one little setting when I could have had half a song done. <laughs> That's a little excessive. Things but. used to go so much faster in the mm. other program. All right. What kind of hardware? You mentioned you have a launch pad. What, what all do you throw down on basically all i've got going on for hardware is a launch pad novation launch pad um the 61 key oxygen midi keyboard mm -hmm. and um there is a rarely used akai mpd that we have toyed with and actually actually we used that on a couple occasions in three blind minds songs i think that and the oxygen, the keyboards, obviously. Yeah. Got play. Got out of all the. I'm not even sure if we had the launch pads at that point, but that and the keyboards got play used on ghosts in the collective quite a bit. Right, right, and you're right. I don't think we had the launch pads yet. I think we were anticipating the launch pads for the next mm -hmm. album, which we will probably be mm -hmm. utilizing those plenty. I need to bust mine out more. And you have more sounds for us from the Subliminal Deep Good Times upcoming album. Indeed, I do. What would you like to play for us now? The next track we're going to play is the title track, and it is, as you would expect, called Subliminal Deep Good Times. Now, this track is featuring Control Alt Destroy, but not quite the Control Alt Destroy that you've all come to know. This is back in 2005 when we made this song. So um, what this was, was um, Randy was working on something for a completely different project. And you had the basic outline of some percussion and uh, maybe a few little MIDI synths configured. And it was one of those things where you, you just kind of threw it at me and was just like, oh, okay, here, do whatever to this. 
So I took it and this is what I came up with. Subliminal Deep Good Times, featuring Control Destroy. drives you to create music? I guess it's just always been in me to make sound. Like, I just always wanted to, to experiment with sound. When I was, you know, I, I took the piano lessons and everything, and I would quickly get bored with piano practice and having to play the song that I was assigned to play. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd rather, I started to, to rather jam a little bit mm -hmm. and decided I had more fun with it that way. And, you know, not necessarily just imitating the notes that I'm reading on the page, um, which um, you know, nothing wrong with learning that. That's great knowledge. But I just kind of fell away from that aspect of music and started delving more into the improv and and jamming a little bit like when i was like eight or nine even i remember like stealing my older brother's guitar that he got and he didn't use it very much but you know he he had it and i would take it and i would just sit there and make terrible noises on it terrible noises <laughs> like not 
blatantly not <coughs> even trying to play the guitar the proper way, but really just playing with noise. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's kind of where it all really started driving me to, to create. And then, you know, as I said, 2005, I started learning more about the actual mixing process and the actual making of electronic music. And I guess that put two and two together. I was like, well, now I can kind of organize a few of my little weird the noise, noises yeah. that I like to make. And Structure here we go. <laughs> what or who do you feel has the most influence on your music? Hmm. A lot of the times it comes from just like weird little inner feelings and little weird emotions. And some of it is pertaining to do with like nature and stuff like that. And like, sometimes I get like, I love the sound of say like wind chimes and stuff like that. So you'll notice certain, certain reoccurring sounds in a lot of my stuff. Like you'll notice little chimey sounds that are, you know, reverberate in the background and stuff like that. It's like wind chimes and stuff like that. A lot of my friends, as far as people, um, old bands, new bands, like a lot of the new music I listen to influences me a lot these days too, because with the internet now, finding new music is a completely different thing. Oh yeah. I listen to completely, I think I hear a new band every day, you know, mm -hmm. and scouring the internet for different sources and getting into collaborations with Three Blind Minds and everything coming together like that mm -hmm. would be the in major influence on my music. Oh, yeah. I know a lot of people say, like, it's the sound my soul makes. And, yeah, that's a great way to put it. it mm -hmm. Just kind of the sound that comes out when I think that what it should sound like. You know what I'm <laughs> yeah, saying? Yeah. Like, I think these weird thoughts... And that's what this should sound like. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, if you can, that's, that's good, though. If you can, like, accomplish that, if you, like, have these thoughts or these feelings and you can lay down the sound and be like, that's it. That's what it sounds that's like. Awesome. I can't explain it with words, but this is what it would sound like. <laughs> oh, yeah. Although, um, I do intend to include more vocals and, like I said, like the, maybe the singer-songwriter aspect of things will come into play more for me in the future too because mm -hmm. i've always i i love instrumental music and that's always going to be a part of what i do and uh but i do understand the appeal to mixing vocal even if it's just vocal snippets mm -hmm. sometimes even that makes a difference yeah for sure what about bird chirp sounds bird chirps um yeah you know it depends I like nature, like, don't get me wrong, but, you know, if it sounds natural, sure, I'm down with it. Mm. But if it's like a bird squawking at my face, like, 50 times in a row, I'd be like, what kind of robot bird are you? <laughs> <laughs> I remember a conversation, I believe, in the group that you, and I think Drazen had over one of Drazen's songs. I, uh, you know, I love, I do love bird. Birds are fine with me in music. I don't nothing against no bird hate. Stirring up some shit. <laughs> but robot birds, that's like, you know, that's like Sonic the Hedgehog. These are robot birds. <laughs> yeah, yo, yo. <laughs> they yeah. scare me, that's all. You gotta set that furry free. Are you inspired by non-music sources, and if so, what? Are you you kind of touched on that a little bit. Done, yeah, like, you know, yeah. Non-music sounds, to me, take on a musical appeal, like, you know, wind chimes. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know that, you know, wind chimes are a little different because technically they are hitting notes, but it's driven by the wind, which is, you know, totally cool to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um... Nature sounds, you know, like, like, I'm down with the bird chirp, everyone. Nature sounds cool. <laughs> I regret bringing it up a little bit, but I had to. <laughs> um, you know, I don't need a safari of animal noises. Mm -hmm. Maybe someday if I was, like, intending to do a completely nature-y, like, super tribally sounding thing, maybe I'd incorporate a few more animal noises and whatnot. Nature sounds, if you will. 
Louis with the animal hate. Mating calls. Mating calls. Oh, this is a sound of love <laughs> in the jungle. Jungle love. <laughs> oh, I think that's been done. Okay. <laughs> Subliminal jungle love. And you have more spins to spin. Wait, no, that's not good. <laughs> We've got more spins to spin. We've got more spins to spin. What are you spinning for us next? This time I'm spinning a track called Inner Master. Now this is kind of a part of the album where I start going away from the more upbeat songs that I deliver in the first half of the album and I'm starting to get a little bit darker. This is probably the most neutral song on the album. Um, and this was originally produced in 2008 hmm. and then yeah and then revamped just recently uh, so enjoy inner master famous or anything but i would like for people to enjoy my music mm -hmm. i'd like it to reach the right audience mm -hmm. like if somebody doesn't 
dig what I'm doing. Like I'm not, I don't want to go to some place and advertise to a group of those people. You know what I'm saying? I, my biggest goal is just making my music reach the right ears. How long do you see yourself making music? And if it's not forever, what would make you quit and why, or why would you quit? I would always keep making music. Um, even if I don't always release material, I would always keep making music. Mm -hmm. The next question, the next couple of questions are always kind of awkward. And I think it's the way I phrased them, but it usually gets pretty good answers. Um, what do you think of the ever changing landscape for the music industry and music distribution in the digital age? And how does it affect you? Um, it's, uh, it's kind of sad, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, I mean, it's turned from like this big industry and, you know, record sales and, and that's what it was all about. And now you see a lot of those big corporations almost becoming childlike in the way that they want it back. They want that power back in the, and with the digital age, they, they don't have it anymore. New music is going in a different direction, and they, and they obviously they don't like it because you hear about lawsuits and all these different things and piracy and whatever. And you know, a lot of people are just making music because they enjoy it. They want mm -hmm. people to hear it. Half the time, they're giving it out for free. Mm -hmm. You know, so and how it affects me is uh, actually it just. To a certain extent, it makes it easier for me to get it out there because I know that I can jump on Bandcamp and I can sort of try and reach out to my that target audience that I'm hoping, mm -hmm. you know, the people who are going to feel me and actually enjoy the sounds that I'm making will hear it. Not like I'm not trying to like broadcast it to somebody who likes country music or anything like that they're not going to probably dig what i'm doing here it comes up a lot on the show unless they like all kinds of different music i i can't say that you know. like really wide-minded but sure or open-minded but which is rare so i mean yeah there's exceptions everywhere yeah but in general if you're doing kind of um unusual ambient music a lot of the music that a lot of people in the group do does go for like a niche audience you know yeah mm -hmm. which is fine and like that's uh, like i totally understand like some people have different preferences with music and me i've always been very open to music like i can sit there and listen to like jazz and classical and and even certain kinds of like bluegrass and country i don't necessarily like the like mainstream stuff very much in any way but like if you're talking to me about some like johnny cash which was mainstream back in the day, but that's like classic shit. Mm -hmm. So I dig that, you know, I mm -hmm. dig that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, some bluegrass is all right with me too. I'm, I'm all about it. Like I like the acoustic sounds too. Um, one of my album concepts actually, uh, eventually I did want to delve into a more acoustic project. So look for that in the future someday. You never know when it's going to happen, but mm -hmm. I think I might throw a little some of that out there sometime you've mentioned it in reference to three blind minds a couple of times too and every time i'm like i don't know what to play i can't play acoustic <laughs> i'm not very good <laughs> yeah. if you take away my mixing skills it all falls apart <laughs> <laughs> but not to say we can't dabble oh we can dabble but some acoustic subliminal hit would be like a like an album of acoustic uh oriented stuff would be oh. sweet oh yeah and, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, like, unplugged or anything. Like, maybe it'd even be, like, some guitar with some FX still uh, applied to it. An FX junkie. I'm an FX junkie. Even my acoustic shit's going to have some effects <laughs> yeah. going on. So don't think that it's not going to be eclectic or it's not going to be psychedelic just because I say it's acoustic. Mm. It's probably still going to be both of those. <laughs> <laughs> And you mentioned earlier that you had kind of a light and dark, you, you that you went from kind of upbeat to like a more downbeat or dark section on the album. Right. So, um, and I remember at the beginning you were talking about the whole, like playing on the themes of the light or dark. Yes. Does that play into your next song by chance? Um, actually, it does, and 
it's kind of funny because I didn't really originally plan it like that, but as I was listening through tracks, I was like, you know, this would be the perfect title for it. And so I had, you know, subliminal deep good times and, you know, I had a few, you know, upbeat, nice, you know, chill songs. And then going into the darker side of my music, I decided to title this one subliminal dark times. So... Um, just to play on words, like I still throw the subliminal in there, but it's dark times. It's instead dark. Of, you know, like you can't have the highs without the lows. This is true. So, um, yeah, this is kind of delving into the darker part of the album. And you can basically hear it in, with the more creepy tones that I start using towards the end. And they're a little bit more uh, devious. Devious. And you said this is one of the newer tracks you put together? This is this is the newest um, actual original track. Mm-hmm. Um, I produced this in 2010. And, you know, for up until now, it was titled First 2010 because it was the first song I mixed <laughs> in the year 2010. And then, you know, as I was building upon the concept of the album, I was like, you know, this is the perfect, like dark version of the title track. So here it is, Subliminal Dark Times.
collaborate with any other musician in the world, whether they're alive or dead, who would it be and in what capacity? I would have had a blast jamming out with some old classical rock bands. Like, you know, back in the 60s and stuff like that, if I could go jam with, say, like, The Doors, mm -hmm. I think that'd be awesome. Like, you know, on a good night, you know, say they're having a really fun practice night, that'd be awesome to jam with The Doors. Like, I know that they... You know, every band has their struggles and issues, and you wouldn't want to be around at the wrong time, no, yeah. obviously. But uh, I think it, I think that'd be one of my favorite things. Because what would it be like, you know, to meet up with uh, old 60s, and they're into experimentation, and they're into, like, cutting film and rearranging it in, a phys in the physical way back in those days. What would it be if, if you showed them... Oh like, yeah, and and if you got to collaborate with them, like say if we had a time machine or something, mm -hmm. we got to go back, and I'd be like, hey, I've got this track that you guys can do whatever to, and just let them do whatever they do. Oh yeah, that'd be fun. Would you take like e modern equipment back with you, or would you just take like stuff you've made back? Um, there? I you know I probably if I could go back in time, I would like to amaze some of the people with some of the devices. Be like, hey, you know what? Mm -hmm. This is what. You see what you're doing right there? That pioneered into this. Yeah, hell yeah. Blow some minds. Yeah. But, you know, there's that... Have you ever heard that... Um, It's a Skrillex and Doors song. It's where yeah. he worked with the with the Doors, and they use... I think it was Morrison. They use a clip of... Yep. Like, an interview of Morrison talking about, in the future, he's seen, like, one person on a machine making all this music absolutely the guy yeah he saw it coming you that's know awesome. and that's, that is awesome he was uh he was definitely a very visionary person you know and obviously i don't you could say a lot of that had to do with his lifestyle but he he touched base on that like there's no denying that mm -hmm. like regardless of his state of mind at the time that was very coherent and clear uh-huh for sure now we're gonna flip flip that last question on its head think of a musician that you cannot stand someone you have no interest uh in listening to at all or or no respect for hypothetically if you were obligated for whatever reason you have to work with this artist could you do it and in what what would you have them do um you know i'm not big on the whole like pop and mainstream thing and i'd say i'm not exactly very fond of like Nicki minaj that's not the first time she's been brought she's, up uh, she's uh kind of an attention whore and you blatantly see that and obviously she's doing it to be famous to to have the money that she's getting obviously and you know i just what do you that's what you're doing it for then like good job like you that's all you're doing it for you're just making money in and being an, att an attention whore mm -hmm. like i don't hear very much creativity out of it mm -hmm. if i had to work with this person <laughs> yeah. i would try my hardest to bring more originality into the process which of course her agents and producers probably wouldn't let me, Good but, point. <laughs> you know, Good I would point. try my hardest to make a more original sound mm -hmm. and, uh, she wouldn't get to do vocals. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. You have more music from this upcoming badass album. I do have a few more tracks, although I'm not going to release all of them here on the show tonight. Um, just a few of these ones are the ones I kind of wanted to highlight for everybody and kind of give every, it gives you a pretty good overall taste of what the album mm -hmm. is as a package. Um, this next track is the only track on this album that has my vocal samples. In oh, it. yeah, yeah. Um, and they're really old vocal samples. This is one of those 2005ers where I'm very experimental, very new at this. And, you know, so I decided to do a couple of little vocals. Now, the mic I used for this one, I'm pretty sure was just the computer microphone, you know, like the old school, like 1999 computer that I had uh -huh. way back when. So like recording quality isn't the thing here, but uh, I did 
what I could to like beef it up, revamp mm -hmm. it, and make it presentable. Um, this track is called Tellin' Lies to make it seem, and it's pretty self-explanatory when you actually hear what the vocals are saying, but it's very warped and twisted the way that I mixed it together, but you shall see. Enjoy. Same. Isn't it so weird that back in the day, isn't it so weird that back in the day you were recording vocals for your song into like a little computer mic? Yeah. And now we're just sitting here, we've been sitting here we've for got two like hours just mic talking right on like face, the like... nicest mic we've ever had. Oh! I'm surprised that that didn't do that earlier because I felt my shoulder bump on it a couple of times. That was amazing. <laughs> Sorry, dude. The studio's falling down on us yeah. again. No, that's become like a normal staple. That was like an everyday thing. Yeah, that's that's fucking weird. You think we'd fix that by now? I think we just like I just like to keep you guys on your toes. <laughs> it's the wake up call. Yeah. Get up, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, stay down. Don't <laughs> don't fall asleep or go to sleep. Get on the ground. <laughs> Whew. That shit hit hard, dude. <laughs> It actually knocked me out for a period of several minutes. Several um, minutes. I just re <laughs> I just revived Lou. Yeah, a little bit of CPR. Yeah. <laughs> it's some reason he wasn't really breathing. I stopped breathing because <laughs> the bill the bulletin board fell <laughs> on my shoulder. Yeah. Well, for some reason. What were we? Oh, we were just r r ranting about yeah, the mic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We were talking about how. Yeah. It's funny that. And now we just sit around for hours and just talk nonsense at it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, before we used our cheapo little shit mics just for like music purposes. Woo! Now, now I'm gonna knock the mic over. <laughs> we, still we still ghetto. We still ghetto, motherfucker. We got a nicer mic, but we still ghetto. That's right. Now this question trips people up a lot because it's one of those things where you're like, oh shit, you kind of want to like take your time and think about it, but it, don't do it. Okay. Off the top of your head, what are three or four of your all-time favorite albums? First things that popped to mind, favorite album, blah. Shit, man. 
I know it's hard. Yeah, this isn't going to come off the top of my head because it's really hard to say albums for me uh, for recent because I have just been delving into brand new music a lot lately. But some of my favorite like albums that I know has influenced me in, in a big way in music in general would be like Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, and like I do have to say the Doors Soft Parade. Like a lot of those old classic rock bands actually bleed into a lot of my favorite stuff mm -hmm. and which is you know now i'm making newer electronic music but it's kind of like psychedelic mm -hmm. and i i can't say that i came up with that myself like people have been doing this trippy music thing for quite a, a while so mm -hmm. yeah i'm totally influenced by by that like the quality of music aside do you think the reason you can't think of like i mean okay you know your major influences, your all-time favorite albums, like, are the first are going to pop to head. But do you think, like, there's an issue with, like, this concept of the decline of the album in the, like, modern modern age of music? Do you think the album is on the, like, the album as a thing is on the downfall as opposed to singles or? Um, not necessarily. I think at times albums do get overlooked because of things like internet radio and whatnot. Which, um, I've been using Spotify lately, which it's kind of annoying because the ads pop up in the middle of whatever after every so many songs, but I like it because it allows me to listen to a station based on an artist or based mm -hmm. on an album and then say, if it pops up a song at you, you can click on it and look at the whole album that mm -hmm. that song's off of. Mm -hmm. And then if you liked it enough, you could divert yourself completely from the radio station you were listening to and go ahead and listen to the album. So that has been getting me into listening to albums a little bit more um, and checking out newer albums a little bit more. Of course, there's Bandcamp. Mm -hmm. That helps with the album thing. Yeah, it's very album-oriented. I'm a lot more apt to listen to an album as an album on Bandcamp than anywhere else. Uh, SoundCloud, that kind of takes me away from albums a little it's bit kind of because anti, that's, it's yeah. kind of the anti-album. Yeah. It it's like random tracks, like, uh, or SoundCloud to me is kind of like, yeah, the catch all place. Here's my work in progress. What you guys think type place, mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. which, you know, and it's all I got right now, but obviously I'm going to be firing up the band camp soon. And once I do that then Bandcamp's probably going to become one of my primary promotion sources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Name an artist that you absolutely love but are embarrassed of when people find out. Um, you know... Guilty pleasure. Guilty pleasure. And I'm not too embarrassed about it. Vanilla Ice. Really? Yeah. I, you know, I liked Vanilla Ice when I was a kid, and I kind of like, you know... I kind of like it, man. It's yeah. not, you know, now you're okay. it's not my favorite, but you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what the dude's doing now. But during the '90s, like the late '90s, he tried to tap into the like rap metal thing. Yeah. Did you ever hear any of that? I heard a little bit of that, like when he collaborated what with Corn. Maybe sure. I think it, he collaborated. It sounded with like a Corn type. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, and that was you know, I guess if you were asking about all-time favorite bands and i said a few uh classic rock ones um when i was in high school and stuff i loved like more heavier music mm -hmm. like corn mm -hmm. and i you know and i know everybody likes nine inch nails and i did like nine inch nails back in the day as well i didn't become quite as huge of a fan mm -hmm. as most people in emg are but i really did i cannot deny the fact that Nine Inch Nails is a heavy influence in the way I make electronic mm -hmm. music. And I'm sure a lot of people can say that same thing yeah. because, you know, he, he really, he really did kind of pioneer a lot of the like mixing with computers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Brought it out into the open. It's like no hiding it. Like you can tell this is computerized, crazy music for shit. sure. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, he wasn't afraid to let everybody know that it's a computer generated yeah. beat and everything, but all the same. And we used to listen to System of a Down all the time. System dude. of a Down, like I, that you know, I always 
Doug, like heavy grungy music. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And here I am like listening to all kinds of like trippy and chill <laughs> electronic music these days. I still like heavy electronic music too, though. Like, mm-hmm. like I said, my interests in music range very much. Yeah. You have quite a w- wide range of, yeah, quite a wide range of interests. And you have one final song for us tonight. We have a final song, and it's actually a remix that I did of the previous track, uh, Telling Lies to Make a Scene. This is the Tribal Death remix. And really, it's pretty simple. Like, it's basically the reverse track, um, being prominent and the main track being the subliminal part of the song. And so what it kind of sounds like is, like you're in this creepy dark tribal setting and there's like a big boiling pot and you know towards the end of the music you just it just feels like there's like a big tribe of like evil cannibals dancing around the boiling pot and yeah. chanting shit oh uh, yeah <laughs> did you mix this one um yeah yeah okay. this is yeah like i said it's basically telling lies to make it seem uh-huh. just uh-huh. reverse manipulated and you know a few extra effects not just reversed like i did other eq and plenty of other things to it but uh to for the main gist of it yeah it's just basically just tweaked a little oh, bit yeah. differently and it turned out quite different oh yeah it's way different it's pretty sweet and uh i really thought that uh drazen would get a kick out of this because it's a very one of my more like dark demented styles that you hear on the album is probably one of the darker, more demented songs on the entire album. Once again, here's here's to you, happy ending, Ezra. That's right. Triple death. You mentioned you've been listening to uh, like a lot of newer music. What have you been listening to lately? I've been listening to a lot of, um, or like C punk and like um, chill drum and bass and like some of those kind of genres. I've been kind of hopping back and forth between. Uh, there's a couple of artists like um, 
I don't know if many people have heard of like Teebs and um, Daylon and um, No Such Thing. Um, maybe Bonobo would be a more uh, popular name. Um, Bewilderbeast, uh, very psychedelic. That is an amazing name. Yeah. Bewilderbeast. Yeah. Um, just anything psychedelic. There's um, Blank Banshee out of Canada is very trippy music. And I really been digging a lot of that kind of sound these days. I don't know why, but it's just been hitting me. Just kind of feeling that lately. Hitting you in the right spot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, outside of music, what else do you like to do? Hobbies, stuff like that? Um, you know, outside of music, I uh, I like to go out and do my thing. I like to get in touch with nature. I haven't been able to do that very much because it's been cold in Nebraska. So, unfortunately, um, winter is more boring. So, I've been working on other, like other music projects but um yeah i don't like to do very much <laughs> <laughs> i like your first rea your first reaction was like i like to do my own thing <laughs> <laughs> um you know that's right you gotta kick it i kick it with my homies chillax i work try to get out of the house Try not to just be a hermit crab, but sometimes I'm a hermit crab. But it's easy to do it to be a hermit <laughs> crab, man. I I've been uh, a lot more involved with uh, with music than I have been in a long time, so I've been trying to kind of like ride that train. I do like playing around with like images too, though. Like, I, I'm not the best artist or anything like that, but mm -hmm. I like playing with images. It's fun. Yeah. Like, um, photoshopping shit or just yeah. taking pictures or Photoshop, even if it's like making shape or something in, um, paint, okay. make a little mm -hmm. like symbol or shape and then like popping that into some random Photoshop collage or something oh, yeah. like that. Gotcha. I've been getting into that a little bit more lately because it just appealed to me and I've been trying to think of ideas for like album art and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of ignited the flair of trying to work more with visual arts so i guess one other uh, non-music hobby you could say is maybe getting a little bit more into visual arts hell yeah oh yeah i got some good links i'll send you for like stock photos and nice textures and stuff like that free free stuff it's pretty sweet. sweet free stuff is always good yeah i agree i'm a big fan of the free i'm a big fan of the free what is your geekiest interest what do you fanboy over it could be like movies, shows, games, whatever. Um, you know, I always loved uh, playing Super Nintendo games. I was always into like RPGs. I play RPGs. I like play Chrono Trigger and Secret yeah. of Mana yeah, and classic. All the classics. Yeah, I love the classic Super Nintendo games. I actually, you know, I kind of fell away from gaming a little bit mm -hmm. um, as they as the newer systems started coming out. Not to say that I don't enjoy every once in a while playing. But yeah, I, I did fall away from it. So I kind of have always fanboyed over those types of games. And um, recently, uh, me and my roommate sat down and watched, um, mo well, I watched most of, he watched the entire series of Star Trek from beginning to end, all the movies, everything. All the series, all the movies. Everything. And, you know, I caught a lot of that and ended up enjoying it quite a bit. So, and I know that um, you're into The Who, yep. and I'm down with uh, Doctor, checking out. Yep. So, you know, I fanboy over a little bit of the sci-fi stuff, you uh -huh. know, I'm down with that, so... Yeah, I'm down with some of the geek stuff. It's, it's fun. <laughs> I've been making my way through the classic Doctor Who and all that, but I can't believe he got through. We're talking about Steve, by the way. Yeah. I can't believe he got through classic Star Trek out up to what was the last one? The last series with was it the one with Bacula? Uh, yeah, the one with Bacula. It was it's terrible. <laughs> I I couldn't do it. <laughs> He even told me, he was like, you know, I really didn't even like it. I was just doing it to say that I watched all of them. He, even said, he was you. like, I don't even, I didn't even care if I didn't really watch it. Like if I fell asleep through it, I'd be like, well, we got through that one. 
<laughs> oh man, I can't believe he powered through all of it. That's impressive. That's funny though. At the end, it's, yeah, at the end, you're kind of calling him out. Next time, somebody. Next time, he's like, "Yeah, I watched them all." They'd be like, "Bullshit." <laughs> Louis says otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to expose you, Steve. <laughs> That's funny. No, I don't blame him though, because you know they. I don't know. They. They could have done something really cool with that because it was supposed to be like before the Federation, right? Uh -huh. And I know this is kind of getting into some SMD territory here, but oh, that's all right. They could have done so much better. And there's certain things like they ran into the Borg already, and it's like, no, you don't run into the Borg <laughs> before the Federation is formed. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> you don't run into the Borg. Oh, I mean, shit. I guess you could try and fit it in some, but it, it, it was terrible. It just didn't work? No. That's funny. I mean, at least with the older, like, I like the cheesy disc of the older Star Trek mm -hmm. stuff. I like old, old cheesy stuff. I like, I like cheesy kung fu, yeah. and I like cheesy movies. So they oh, yeah. entertain the shit out of me. I get a kick out of it. Oh, yeah. I love me some cheesy kung fu. To a point, like, you can have, definitely have overload, but I watched. Sure. And I wouldn't really say it was, like, really good, but I watched The Man with the Iron Fist, which was the RZA directed kung fu movie that would be it, yeah it wasn't bad you, you like the cheesy kung fu you should check it out it's definitely like influenced by the cheesy kung fu like every all the especially the bad guys they all have like really wild bad <laughs> wigs for hairdos and shit i love that stuff i don't know why but it just cracks me up and i enjoy it <laughs> yeah. what is next for you but you got that album do you want to talk about that more yeah i could talk a little bit more i mean you know basically like I said, it's it was just my decision to release older material before I went into releasing anything else because I've been doing it since 2005, and so I have this library of crap that nobody's ever heard. Yeah. And so I don't want to just be like, oh, here's all my new shit right away. It's kind, like, of, kind of like some closure. It's like you can flip the page on that chapter and actually like work on new stuff right because although i've been doing this for a while i this is the first time i've actually attempted to even create something that i can promote uh -huh. so it is a new thing for me and a lot of a lot of the times i'll probably be viewed as a new artist which yeah. i'm totally fine with because i never even tried to get my name out there before anyways mm -hmm. like i'd have a facebook or i'd have a even a myspace or the acid planet but it was just there yeah and if somebody stumbled on it then they stumbled on it but other than that i'd maybe post it here and there randomly i have a stack of yeah. CDs over there that say subliminal hit. Oh yeah, yeah I have lots of You've like got all this stuff. You have like unofficial albums. There were that you some put together unofficial albums and like distributed to friends and family and stuff. Yep. But um, this is your first like official. Throw it out in the world to the world. Say this is my release. Check yeah. this out. Yep. Yeah. This is the first one. So yeah, yeah, I do. I have a stack of different CDs. There's like three unofficial albums that i put out that were like mixed out of the program rave ej yeah rave ej <laughs> yep. and you could only mix like eight tracks and it had limited loop creation ability that i liked to play with and um the cool thing is is i'd take some of those loops that i made in ej and i'd and i'd resample them through mm -hmm. other programs like free loops or acid and actually some of the songs off of this album will include some of those manipulated EJ. I did samples. catch that when I was mastering it. I, <laughs> I caught that. Some of that, I was like, "That's some fucking EJ shit." I like using some crude methods to make samples sometimes because you can always go and reprocess it into something different. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe it was really, really rough and raw when you first sampled it off of the cheapo program mm -hmm. but then you take it in and you clean it up a little bit add a few extra things to it it's a completely different sound yeah now i want to say it out maybe i want to say some ej ej created lupus went into ghosts as well oh yeah but definitely yeah. definitely some ej origin originated from ej loops. yeah yeah because it kind of had like a weird sequencer synth function yeah and i know you used to fuck around with that a lot oh yeah oh yeah you know i mean it's kind of like 
twisting the knob or pulling mm -hmm. the slider while you're recording, but instead it's taking the mouse and adjusting it j just the same way, except with the mouse, basically. Uh -huh. Where can people find your music and websites? Pimp your shit. At this point in time, you can find my music at soundcloud.com slash subliminal dash hit. Now, when I release this album, you will find that both on SoundCloud and at subliminalhit.bandcamp.com. Um, you know, I've got kind of the skeleton outline of the way I want my Bandcamp page to oh, look. Do you, have a, do you have it set up and stuff already? Sort of. Um, the only thing I really need to do is upload it. Okay, so, so that's subliminalhit.bandcamp.com? Subliminalhit.bandcamp.com, and that'll be officially up and running when I release Subliminal Deep Good Times. So... What are you waiting on on this album? <laughs> <laughs> well, this album contains a special little treat uh, <laughs> that I can't release the album until this special little treat is complete. Um, there will be a Control Destroy remix. Yeah, I've been holding you. I've, okay, okay, I will take the heat on it because <laughs> no, I've been no hold, problem. I've been holding the album back. Make you wait. You had me. You had me master it. Which I was happy to do. It just took me fucking... And I appreciate that, by the way. You did a great job. Vacation mode. Hey. <laughs> and, you know, I have been working on other stuff. Like, I say vacation mode. And I've been taking kind of a big break from music. But that's not to say I haven't been working on other stuff. But I finally got around to mastering it. So that was a hold up. And then the remix that you listened to tonight. So. My fault, people. It's all right. Hey. It's worth every minute. It is oh, it's so sweet. <laughs> sweet release. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you a ton, Lou. It's weird making eye contact when you're... Thanks, Lou. No problem, man. <laughs> what if we did the whole show like this? That would have been so weird, dude. That would have been totally weird. <laughs> <laughs> dude, no eye contact. This is why Skype is better. I don't look at my friends. I don't look at my friends ever. Actually, no, I did watch you most of the time. You <laughs> That's were just cool. talking. But, um, no, this is very cool. I do wish I could do... One-on-one -on -one interview, yeah, it seems in more person. like a yeah. relax. And uh, naturally, it's easier to, you know, talk to somebody face-to-face mm -hmm. -face than it is to through computers. Definitely, and you don't run into... Generally, you don't run into the awkward, like, interruptions and fucking pauses. Like, you know, we're here, we can gauge when... Yeah, we we know that when we say something like you heard it right away. Oh yeah, rather than saying something and then you have to realize that like, did the person didn't hear it until maybe like two three seconds later. Yeah, yeah. But all in all, it went well. It was awesome interviewing you. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. Thank you, thank uh, you for yeah. letting me do an interview show. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It's a little bit different sitting in the interviewee spot than it is being co-host. Mm -hmm. Because normally I'm just kind of help d deliver information and whatever, and now I'm actually, like, talking about myself. Oh, so. it's all, the focus is on you. Yeah. And it was cool, it was cool interviewing you, having, sometimes, like I said, it was weird asking you a question that I already knew <laughs> the answer already to. the answer, yeah. <laughs> but it was also cool, like, posing questions to you with, also, you know, n with knowledge so that I could, like, take it take the question that extra step or whatever you know yeah exactly yeah i think it worked out very well I, I, i'm i'm pleased with it yeah and just before we go i guess i'll repeat we'll hit some some repeat some news repeat some news hits hits the news first off um once again if you want to check out lou's stuff uh he goes by the moniker of subliminal hit uh when his album comes out it'll be subliminalhit.bandcamp.com Indeed. Um, till then, you can check out his sounds on soundcloud.com slash subliminal dash hit. And that is correct. And you're also on Facebook. Is it subliminal? Yeah, it's um, the Facebook page, which has nothing on it, but, you know, just for novelty, it's facebook.com slash subliminal dot hit, I think. That uh, might be. If yeah. not, you can try subliminal dot hit or <laughs> subliminal hit. <laughs> Maybe we should look this <laughs> yeah, up to be for up. sure. <laughs> Here, let's try misleading information. No one will ever visit it. Let's try sublim subliminal dot hit. 
Yes. Oh, it just goes straight to it. Oh. Oh, that's it, nice. It deletes the dot for you. That's so you nice. can type it in either way. Type it in either way. Fuck it all up. Maybe you'll get there. <laughs> Maybe you'll find Okay, it. but technically it's just subliminal hit. No spaces, no dot. But right. we did put the dot in. And it worked. And it took us there anyway. That's pretty nice. It's cool. Self-correction. And um, when I do release the album, I'm sure the page will change a little bit. I'm going to start uploading more of the art that's going to be going with the album and whatnot when that occurs. Right now it's pretty bare bones. Not much happening with it. That, I like your logo there. Yeah, yeah. That, the logo, the cover picture, if you do end up visiting it, um, that was actually put together by Randall. <laughs> the great Randall Sylvia. I, I think I'd be back, back then, too, back in the oh, day. Oh, that was when we were conceptualizing uh, Three Blind Minds stuff. So that was 06 uh, like or 05, 06 oh, so, yeah. era, yeah. Oh, 07 yeah. was when I moved to Lincoln, so yeah. oh, oh, okay. five, oh, six was when we were all in Fremont. So, see, I can never keep I can never keep the timeline straight. I'm gonna have to go by what happened in your life in order to happen <laughs> in my life at what time. Okay, hey, hey, whatever works. You moved to Lincoln. See, I remember you moving to Lincoln. That was 07. That puts a time reference. Yeah, that was like right at the very end of 06, at the very beginning of 07. Okay. All right, so be sure to be sure to check him out. Give him a like. Um. All Check that shit, and of course, I'll I'll link to I'll link in the show notes to everything subliminal hit related, and anticipate the release of subliminal deep good times. It should be coming soon because everything's getting wrapped up here. So everything's ra- getting. Look wrapped. out for it. EMG will be the first to know, but of course, on the same day, I'm gonna start posting it everywhere else too. Yep. Um, on EMG front, <laughs> EMG website is dead. Go to emgradio.blogspot.com. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Um, we're still out there. We're on YouTube as well. That's all. That's YouTube.com slash EMG Artist, but I don't think we have anything there yet. We will. We will. No, there's some music. We have music there. Yeah. Go there and listen to uh, the Halloween album. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, go you to, uploaded a couple of those. Go to e-m-g.bandcamp.com to listen to the End of the World compilation album if you want some, like, apocalyptic epic shit. Um... Also, the Halloween album in EMG 1.0, which Subliminal Hit is on all three, isn't it? You yes. have tracks on all three. Yeah, I have uh, Yeah, tracks on all of those, nice. and they are completely separate from any other real project that I have done. So mm-hmm. Those That's were made specifically for those albums. Exclusive. 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 We love exclusives. We love the exclusive material. And EMG Radio will be back soon. We have something special planned for the next episode, something totally different that we haven't done before. It's gonna be wild. I don't want to. I don't want to drop too much information on. I don't want to spoil it. Yeah, but I'm kind of excited because it, I'm gonna be coming. I'll be. I'll be on a new side of the glass, so to speak. So I'm excited to see how that goes. That is exciting. Um, and then beyond that, we'll have the return of regular episodes, more interviews. It's just we'll take a little longer to get to you. Yeah, I mean, it just won't be on that every week. And I know that, it, you know, for some people that enjoyed that, looked forward to it, you know, but we're still going to make a presence. So. We'll still make a presence. It'll give you more time to savor what's there. Listen, listen, listen to it a couple times. Listen to it at your leisure. Yeah. Well, and it'll give us more material to yep. compile. We'll be able to load that barrel fuller when we come back and hit you with it. Indeed. Is that a saying? <laughs> it is now. It is now. <laughs> we'll come back with... Double two barrel. Double barrel. Double barrel. Double barrel, motherfucker. Forget that little weekly pea shooter. We're going to hit yeah, you with it double it. barrel. Shoot. Bullshit. <laughs> double barrel on your face. <laughs> Bitch. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry for that display of aggression. I like you slip back into co-host mode. You never really let the, this was an interesting interview because you being the co-host are used to like. I'm used to just kind of regurgitating just it, some you information know. and I, you notice, maybe adding a few cues here and there. That's what we do when we riff off each other. We like, all three of us will sit here and I'm listening to them. I notice like somebody will be like, oh, motherfucker, bitch. And then somebody will be like, yeah, bitch, <laughs> motherfucker. And then we just like repeat it until it becomes something new. <laughs> Truthfully, we just like to berate the audience. Once again, thank you for coming coming over, Lou, and recording this. Absolutely. This anytime, is... anytime. It's always a pleasure. Uh-huh. I feel like I should shake your hand. We shall. We're shaking Official. hands. Official. 
And thank you, listeners, for checking it out. Um, we hope you're excited to be back. We're excited to be back. And we will be back again. Peace out. Peace. Go make some fucking music. <laughs>